temperatures to a quarter of a degree above absolute zero, which is very cold. Um, but in order to get there, we have to go through a couple stages of cryogenics. So the pulsing sound you hear is how we get down to 4 Kelvin. Um, so basically, instead of having Flint deliver us liquid cryogens every couple days, which is a lot of work for him, we have these pulse tubes, and essentially it's compressed helium gas at 250 psi, and then it expands rapidly. You know when you like ex uh, when you spray an aerosol can, and it expands, it cools off. Yeah. Same idea, but in this case we're using helium, so it gets down to 4 Kelvin. So that's awesome. Yeah. Don't need any liquid cryogens, but we use about 20 kilowatts of power, so it's a trade-off. But anyway, so we get to 4 Kelvin, and this is what one of these pulse tubes looks like. I'll show you the actual thing later, but this is the part that's inside the cryostat. So this is at 4 Kelvin, and this is at 50 Kelvin, and this is Dana, who's our winter over. Okay. Um, he's wintered for us three times, and he's wintering again this year. So this here is the box, um, also known as a cryostat, and this outer shell is at 300 Kelvin, uh, which is room temperature. The next shell in is 50 Kelvin, so it's connected to this stage of the pulse tube here. And then the inner shell is at 4 Kelvin connected to this stage. Okay. But all of our detectors are superconductors, and their transition is around half a Kelvin. Are you sure you're drunk? Because you're doing very well. <laughs> I think we're a lot drunk. This is like ladies' night number five. Um, but anyway, so how do we get that cold? And the answer is we use helium-3, which is another type isotope of helium. It's lighter, and it gets colder when you pump on it. So this is a Simon Chase refrigerator. It has two helium-3 stages, and that's what each one of these are. And it fills up with helium-3, and then you pull a vacuum on it. So you know how up here at altitude, when you boil water, it actually boils at a lower temperature? That's because there's a lower pressure. So if you pull a complete vacuum on it, it'll boil even lower. So that allows us to get down to 250 millikelvin. That's a quarter of a degree above absolute zero. Super cold, and it's perfect for our detectors. And absolute zero in Fahrenheit? Minus 454. Okay. Very cold. Um, so that's, that's great. So that's what we use to get really cold, and I'll show you the hardware in a minute. But this stuff is all inside the cryostat, so you can't see it. Um, these are our detectors. Uh, this is actually our old camera. It was on the telescope for five years. And this is the new one. We just built it last year, and this summer we've been upgrading it. And the idea is you just have this superconducting thing. So a superconductor is zero resistance. You can put as much current as you want in, and it'll just keep flowing current, and you don't have any sort of dissipative power at all. So that's what this represents, zero resistance. And then you have some transition, and then you get a finite resistance. So in between those, you have this super sharp curve. So you get a little tiny bit warmer, and the resistance goes way up. So we stick our detectors right here in this transition, and then when a super faint photon from the sky hits our detectors, it'll raise it by a tiny temperature, but then that's a huge change in resistance, so we can measure that. So what we're measuring is the cosmic microwave background, which is this kind of like wavy pattern you see here. It's not actually noise. That is primordial fluctuations in the density of the universe. So our universe is incredibly uniform, no matter what direction you look in. But on the, on the scale of one part in a million, you see these tiny fluctuations. And then the reason we have such a huge dish is because we don't want to just see these broad scale fluctuations. We also want to see these point sources, which are some of the oldest galaxies in the universe. And also these shadows here. So these shadows are clusters of hundreds to thousands of galaxies bound with really hot gas, trillions of degrees. So this faint background radiation, that's from 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And that's about 3 Kelvin now. So it's really low temperature, and we detect it at 150 gigahertz. So that radiation's coming towards us. It's all the way across the visible universe, 13.6 billion years ago. These clusters of galaxies are much closer to us. So these photons, they're coming towards us, and they hit these clusters of galaxies, and they scatter away. So what we see are these shadows. And each one of these shadows corresponds to thousands and thousands of galaxies. So we, we want to measure those, and then by determining how many of these clusters there are in the universe, we can learn something about what the universe is made of. And so that's the goal of our experiment. So you said what the darker ones are. What are the lighter ones? Um, these are typically, they're either quasars, which are supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, sucking in hundreds of stars per year, and they emit an X-ray, mostly, but we can still see them at wavelengths. And the other thing they are are dust-obscured galaxies. So you have a galaxy that has a lot of stars in it, but if you looked at it with a visible telescope, you wouldn't see anything because there's too much dust. But when you irradiate dust with visible light, it ends up getting hotter,
then it radiates into microwave frequencies, which we detect. So some of these are the oldest galaxies in the universe. And so did the same telescope detect microwave frequencies and also temperature change? Or is well, it solely just slight temperature change? It's just slight temperature change. Okay. But, um, so what we use are bolometers, which are these superconducting things. And a very small temperature change on the bolometer is a resistance we can read. But how do you change the temperature of it? You dump any amount of power on it. So for example, if you took a blowtorch and you heated up the outside of our cryostat, we would see that. But that's I was not just thinking if you throw a hundred people drinking wine, the temperature would go up slightly. Yes. In fact, yeah, we've measured yeah. people. Okay. So if people go stand out there and we scan over them, yeah. we can see the person. Okay. Um, we actually made a map of our source out there. You can actually see the road even where the snow is compacted more. Like that shows up in our maps because it's okay. just a very slightly different temperature. Wow. Mm. Um, so it's the same idea. These are just different temperatures, and that's what we measure. So that's, that's the science side. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is our new camera. This is all the old stuff. Um, doesn't just detect power. It detects polarization. So some light wiggles like this. Some light wiggles like this. And so we have a detector like this, and we have a detector like this, and we measure the two. And the cool thing about that is, in the very early universe, we believe there are these things called gravitational waves. Now, the way you detect those now is you take, like, two black holes and crash them into each other. It makes a huge disturbance in the space-time continuum. But in the early universe, we believe there was this thing called inflation, where the universe expanded rapidly. Did you go to Brad's science lecture last week? I did. Okay, so he talked about inflation a bit. And we're trying to measure that by these very minute polarization signals that are imprinted in the cosmic microwave background. No one's detected it yet, but we believe it is detectable, and so that's what we're trying to measure now. Okay. What What's do you want to find? Like, if you could just pick like, one thing for yourself that would, like, throw you off your seat, like, what would you be, like, really, really happy finding? Good question. So, what I'm doing my thesis on is, you see these, like, very large-scale fluctuations? There's also much smaller scale ones. So in the very early universe, it was all hot gas. But as you know, when gas gets hotter, the atoms dissociate. So all the electrons get stripped off of the atoms and you have a plasma. So our sun is a plasma. The very early universe, you can approximate as a sun. It's super hot, everything's just bouncing around. And as it cooled off, all the atoms recombined and the radiation could free stream. So that's what the cosmic microwave background is. But then at some point, the universe became ionized again. And no one really knows how this happened. So was it early black holes? Was it early stars? No one's really sure, and no one knows when it happened. So what I'm measuring for my thesis is these actually, there's smaller scale fluctuations that you can kind of see, you know, here's light, here's dark, but here's light, and here, this tiny one's also dark. Okay. So the smaller scale fluctuations are something I'm trying to measure. And some of the signal in those small scale fluctuations was imprinted at later times by the universe reionizing itself. And so if you can measure that signal, you can get some constraint on when the universe reionized, and then you might know what did it. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to measure. I don't know if I'll be able to see that signal, but I'm working on the analysis now, and hopefully within a year I'll know. That's excellent. Yeah. So it's kind of just this open question. No one knows, and hopefully I can help answer it. Yeah. All right, let's go with some hard work, that's my favorite part. <laughs> I've already been in your book. So, I have a question too. Okay. What, what would be the biggest difference you would describe between what the South Pole Telescope does and what SPUD does, as far as... Oh, that's an excellent question. So, the inflationary signal I was talking about, mm -hmm. we're both looking for that. But the difference is, their telescope are very small apertures, and um, that's kind of the only signal to be able to see. So we expect that signal on very large scales. The moon is about half a degree, and the scale we expect that on is about two degrees, so about four times the size of the moon. Um, in telescope optics, you have something called a diffraction limit. So the bigger your mirror is, the smaller things you can see. Mm -hmm. So we have such a big mirror that we're able to detect these minute point sources here and these galaxy clusters. Those are on the scale of about an arc minute, which is the diffraction limit of our telescope. So in addition to looking for that signal, we can find all of these additional things. Okay. Um, so it allows us to be a more diverse instrument. No one actually knows if the ablation signal exists, so they're kind of all or nothing. If they never mm. find it, you know, maybe it just doesn't exist. But if we never find it, there's additional <coughs> science we can do as well. Okay. Yeah. 
cool. So that justifies the giant dish. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, cool. Let's, uh, let's go check out the hardware. One millimeter to three millimeters. And that, that frequency of light just passes right through that window. So that's the focus of our telescope. And then inside of this giant white box here, we have a secondary mirror that brings it to a secondary focus here. And this is the receiver cryostat I showed you. This outer shell would be 300 Kelvin. And this is the pulse tube that I showed you, bringing down the inner radiation shields to the port health. So this entire thing gets lifted up into the receiver cabin, which um, we can see if we open this. We'll try. You want to be on your way Yeah. I, I'm bad at opening it. It's a little sticky, so if you're small, it's hard to... <laughs>
check out the uh, the other room. Oh, At least show like the cable wraps. At uh, Goldstone, they have these 90 meter radio dishes for uh, the space communication. Yeah. It's it will crazy. just crush yeah, it and not care. And keep going. I don't want that. Well, then don't get near it while it's moving.